All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's virtual tour of intentional communities, where we get to have an inside look at three different intentional communities from across the United States. So I feel really lucky to have these incredible communitarians with us, and I'm so excited to learn more about their communities where they live. So my name is Cynthia. I am one of the co-directors at FIC, the Foundation for Intentional Community, and I'll be today's host guiding you through our presentations. So we are going to kick things off with Rachel, who is calling in from Portland, Oregon at Blueberry Community. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks so much for including us and also for last minute tech support. Um, yeah, the first thing I want to say to everyone before I talk about our community is even though we are urban, we are not a very techie community. We don't have a logo. We don't have a website. I myself do lots and lots of teaching and tours and community activism, but it's always in person and usually hands on in a garden or teaching people to fix bikes. So this is the first ever. It's the first ever online presentation I've done. I've had to be in Zoom meetings and it's also the first ever computer based slideshow I've ever done. So please bear with me that it will be very simple. Um, and th there is someone we didn't even have Internet until two months ago. So, um, yeah, so a little more about me quickly. So I'm one of the founders of Blueberry. I have lived here for 15 years since March of 2007. Um, there's a few other original people who are still here. Um, I myself have always lived in community or at least shared housing. I've, I've always lived in shared housing. Not all intentional communities are co-living communities, but with a few very short breaks other than that, I've always lived in shared housing. I mean, starting with my family of origin, but student co-ops, punk houses, um, some urban, some rural. Um, I was one of the founders of Dancing Rabbit Eco Village and we were a co-living community when we started. And I brought the commitment to being sustainable living demonstration project. And, and we can't say the word sustainable anymore, but it's a good shorthand for what we're trying to say. Um, what else? Yeah, some other time I'll talk about my journey from urban to rural, but I've already used up two of my 10 minutes. So um, I decided to refer to Blueberry as a nested community because um, I live in a co-living household, which is four bedrooms on a fifth of an acre lot in a low density urban neighborhood in Portland. And our community is also part of a set of intentional neighbors, which is kind of like organic co-housing. If any of you have heard of um, N Street co-housing in Davis, first co-housing community in the country, I actually lived there in my 20s. Um, we're not, we don't have a common house. So I guess technically we're not co-housing, but intentional neighbors is one of the terms I learned from Lois Arkin to describe that. And then also, if I have time, I'll just talk about our neighborhood, which is called Cully, which makes it all possible. It used to be a very affordable neighborhood when I moved here 15 years ago. Um, small, not necessarily well-built houses built in the depression on lots that are quite large for an urban area. Um, no sidewalks, lots of unpaved streets. And so it attracts people like us who want to live in a space like what you see behind us. Um, I guess it just kind of looks like a sea of vines, but urban farmers is one term that's used for people like us. And uh, there's there's a lot of us in this neighborhood, some living in community, some just being part of the larger community of the neighborhood. Um, okay, so first I will talk about the co-living household and now I'll start my slideshow. So this is our entrance and um, our four panels of our faces are blocking the view up the driveway, but um, in 2007, this was a big lawn and now it's an edible forest garden. And if you really, really look on the left side, you can just barely see the outline of the roof. But basically you can't see the house from the street. The house is under a thousand square feet and there are four bedrooms and the population, the highest number of people we've ever had here has been six. 
uh, a family of three living in one bedroom and a couple living in another bedroom and then two individuals in the other two bedrooms. Um, we don't have a sign that says Blueberry. We just have our address, 4446, pane in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, shouldn't talk too long about any one slide. Um, if you, wa you walk up the driveway, oops, and that's the not very big front porch, which I'm actually standing right next to. We go under the Kiwi Arbor um, to the front door. Um, when we're coming and going by bike, we often walk the rest of the way up the driveway, put our bikes in the garage, go in the kitchen door. Um, so our mission, oh, I didn't, as I said, I'm kind of new to this slideshow thing. So um, this is our mission document, which is our, our community documents are always evolving and it's kind of long for a mission statement. And maybe the things aren't in the right order, but you can see some of our core values. So urban homesteading, radical urban sustainability uh, with a social justice lens, um, things get added, things get rearranged. The garden is really core to what we're doing, food self-reliance, community food justice, DIY, land care, education, um, and uh, I feel sort of bad that social justice is at the end because that makes it sound like it's not the most important thing. And it, this is a thing with um, intentional communities within an ecological focus started by white people with college education is sometimes later we realize that social justice is important. Oops. <laughs> so Here's a core purpose, teaching and demonstrating ecological living with a social justice lens. Um, this is a work and learn party. Um, none of the people in the picture actually live here. They're friends and neighbors who came over to learn food growing skills. Um, this is someone who does live here. One of the other co-founders, Robert, he's lived here since 2007, showing off a basket of potatoes that he just harvested. Um, Potatoes are the thing that the food bank wants most and that we have the least of, but we always have enough greens and fruit for, you know, hundreds of people, really, if you look at what a typical American family eats as far as greens and the bottleneck is actually getting it to the people that need it. But um, there's, there's several, especially since the pandemic, there's an enormous need for um good, clean, safe, nutrient-dense food. And so we give away food lots of different ways. Um, okay, skipped. Okay. Um, I think I have, sorry, I'm having trouble with the slides. So affordable housing is a purpose of most, I mean, or it's a benefit of living collectively and especially living in shared housing. Lots of people get introduced to community living simply because they can't afford to have their own place, um, certainly like in school. Um, but we've explicitly stated that affordable housing is a core purpose here. Um, what does this photo have to do with affordable housing? Well, the house was originally only two bedrooms. In this neighborhood, there's lots of small two bedroom, one bath houses. Um, I put down the money to buy the house. I couldn't afford a four bedroom house. And plus there aren't many four bedroom houses in this neighborhood. So we built two more bedrooms and that little cabin is one of them. Um, that's my personal space. It's a detached bedroom. It doesn't have running water or anything. Um, Base rent here is six fifty a month, which is way below market for the current state of Portland. I know if you live in like Detroit, that might sound like a lot, but um, and then with everything else, like utilities and all the bulk food we buy, um, it comes to seven sixty five. It used to be seven fifty, but we just got internet. Oops, um, and you get all your vegetables. That's free. And we have a provision for rent trade to reduce the rent. Um, the intention is to have people be a good fit rather than just need cheap rent. Um, but there's a lot of ways that people can reduce their rent by putting in more hours. Um, the other thing this photo shows is, uh, this is the backyard vegetable garden. I actually took this photo yesterday. You can see we've got a lot of starts ready to go. Some of them are going to other people's gardens. We have a ton of naturalized plants and edible flowers. And my goodness, I'm almost out of time already. Um, 
I volunteer at my neighborhood school as the garden coordinator. Um, yeah. A lot of us are involved in off farm activism. This is a land back poster for a Black Lives Matter and Indigenous sovereignty demonstration. Um, this is another image of another community member working in the garden. Um, and then here are some of our other sustainable living features besides the garden. Um, we have ducks, they help us care for the land and they also lay eggs and sometimes we eat them. We are not a vegetarian community. Um, we catch rainwater for watering the garden. It says 300 gallons, that meant 3,000, 3, sorry for the typo. Um, this is our very low tech gray water system catching water from the washing machine. Um, we heat with wood, we have a composting toilet. We actually took out the water toilet um, community bike storage. We haul things by bike. That's some of us helping a neighbor move by bike with our trailers. Um, community meals are a shared responsibility. Everyone cooks a meal for the community once a week. And we have this chart on the wall so that everyone knows what is going to meet other people's needs. Um, the only rule is that we try to really minimize our waste stream. We try to not use packaged things to make community meals. We do a lot of bulk orders and bulk shopping at the food co-op. So it's possible to make a really fantastic meal with vegetables from the garden and beans and grays from our bulk stores and eggs from the ducks or from our neighbor's chickens. Um, and sometimes some meat and cheese, which we buy um, or meat that we raise. Um, all right, so that was the co-living community. Now I'll talk about the intentional neighbors. Um, this is a gate in the back fence, kids next door coming over to say hi. Um, intentional neighbors, I learned that phrase from Lois Arkin at Los Angeles Eco Village. It means basically buy a house next door to your friend's house or next door to somebody that you like and you like what they're doing. Um, and so our larger community has grown in this organic way, like N Street co-housing. I know there are other, there are lots of other opportunities for this in the US and around the world. Also, there are neighbors who get to know each other and then put a gate in their fence or tear their fence down. Um, this is what a neighborhood should be like. And uh, this is what, the reason intentional communities are important is because it helps us remember the unintentional community that we would have if we all lived in villages and didn't live under capitalism and move around all the time. Um, uh, okay, uh, this is the front yard. So on the south side of Northeast Going Street, there are three houses in a row. My house is the farthest to the west. Anna and Alex's house is the farthest to the east. Taryn and Jared are in the middle. Um, there's this pass-through in the hedge. This is Anna stepping over the pass-through from Taryn and Jared's yard to her yard. You can see there's some yellow caution tape there. It's also for the mail carrier. We don't need the caution tape, but visitors and the mail carrier might. The, the reason there's a little short fence there is so Anna's ducks don't wander into Taryn and Jared's yard. Um, oops. And Taryn and Jared... So our lots are all a fifth of an acre. Taryn and Jared garden less than the rest. They still garden, but they don't garden as much as some of the other households. They garden their backyard, which is as big as many urban entire lots. And they have given their front yard over to be a community garden. Um, right now, it's mostly Anna's household and my household. There have been people that don't live in our neighborhood at all. Um, taking over a plot in Taryn and Jared's front yard. There was a Young Black Farmers Collective that gardened there for two seasons, but they all left town, as people in their 20s often do. Um, and if the, there's a possibility that another um, mutual aid group will come and take over some beds in their yard. So that's part of our larger community activism. Um, this is my last slide. Um, 
This is on the north side of Northeast Going Street. The four houses in a row over there, their community is it's kind of part of our community, but also um, their lifestyles are a little more mainstream than ours, but they're doing wonderful stuff in terms of community. They all have gates in their backyards. And so the story here is that Joy and Mark's next door neighbors, Joy and Mark live in the slightly larger house. Their next door neighbor Bonita died. The house was for sale. Their nine-year-old son Rowan convinced his best friend Colin and Colin's dad Brian to buy the house. And then Joy and Mark and Brian got together and repaved their driveway for a big play area for Rowan and Colin and Rowan's little sister, Juniper. Um, let's see. Cynthia, can I have another minute or two? Sure, yeah. So um, when people have contacted us, as I said, we don't have a website, but we have an ic.org listing. And so when people have contacted us and asked how to join the community, well, if it's an, individual person or a couple who are living in Portland or moving here and they want to rent a room, well, there's often a room available in our house or one of the other co-living houses. Right now, there's only one other co-living house, um, but that's one way that a, a person can join our community. When people have reached out and said, do you have room for a family of three? I say, well, does your family of three want to rent a room? There is a family of three living in one bedroom in our house right now. But if people want their own place, I say, I will say, well, there's five houses on my block that are for sale. If you buy one of them, you can become part of our community, which is exactly how N Street co-housing grew was simply by, it was a, similarly a more affordable neighborhood with a lot of more affordable houses. And when a house turned over, people would reach out to their larger community and try to get either someone they knew or at least you know a cool person or a cool family to buy it and so that is a way to become part of this community the Cully neighborhood is a community and there's a lot of people that want to move here it's not as affordable as it once was um but um yeah i think that's all of the things yeah, I've used up my time, but I think there's time if somebody wants to ask me a question and then I'll remember if I forgot something. Thanks, check. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciated your presentation and the, the mission of your community, especially to be more affordable. I think that's so important right now with the housing crisis and, um, and also this concept you have of intentional neighbors. I just love that, taking down uh, the fences between neighbors' backyards and, and having those spaces be more shareable. It's amazing. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we, we have some questions for you, a lot of questions. Um, yeah, so let's see. Some questions about um, ownership in the community, like who owns the property um, and uh, yeah, and, and related are any of these homes purchased by groups? Yeah, um, thanks. So all of the individual homes are owned ind independently of each other, which has that in common with N Street and other intentional neighbors communities, which is different, um, like none of the uh, under like, capitalist land tenure it's all owned separately my household is or the lot that it sits on is owned by me i very much want to transition to cooperative ownership but that's not currently the arrangement um but i am i've lived in some true co-ops and um yeah there's an intention to get there and there probably isn't time to talk about more of that but that's that is a strong intention and really hoping that someone will stay long enough who actually wants to do that because what's typically happened is people live here for a couple of years and then they say, I'm going to grad school. I'm moving to Montreal to meet a man I met on the internet. That actually happened, et cetera. Or, or the, the thing that has made me saddest was the, the people who have said, I decided I want to buy my own house. I was like, you could buy this house. But anyway, yeah, that's my answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And someone has asked, is there 
privacy in your community? Are the rooms very close together or how, how do you handle privacy more generally? I would yeah. ask. So none of the bedrooms share a wall with each other. So there's more privacy than in some collective houses I've lived in. Um, the two houses, the, the two original bedrooms in the main house have more convenience but less privacy. The two new bedrooms, one um, is my casita in the backyard and the other is above the garage. So they have more privacy. Um, so yeah, I guess I would say, yeah, that, and um, one of the bedrooms in the main house shares a wall with the living room. So it gets noise from the living room and the other one shares a wall with the kitchen. So it gets a little noise from the kitchen and maybe we could open the walls up and stuff them with insulation, but we haven't done that. And both <laughs> of those bedrooms share walls with the bathroom, but it doesn't seem like they get noise from the bathroom. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And some some people are really curious about this term intentional neighbors. I think you had mentioned you learned that from Lois Arkin at LA Eco Village. Are there are you do you know of any other resources around that concept or how could people learn more about what it means to do that? I don't know. The only, I mean, the only other model I'm familiar with is N Street because I used to live there. I know that others exist. I also know that informally it happens. It happens in places where there's a lot of turnover and where the houses aren't quite as expensive. So community minded people are more able to buy them. I definitely know of other situations where people have, you know, just bought houses next door to each other that happened to be for sale at the same time or I mean how we got started was Teresa and Norris who bought Taryn and Jared's house in 2006 actually when I told them that I was interested in buying a house they said well the house next door is for sale and in fact both houses next door are for sale you get to pick which one you want so yeah I mean I don't know of specific resources for finding that circumstance I guess, yeah, the, we have, I didn't talk about, I forgot to talk about the other, the other kinds of both formal and informal sharing. The, the informal sharing that we do is what I think of as being good neighbors. You know, if Anna and Alex are going on a road trip for a month and we're gonna take care of their ducks and their cat and water their garden, that's the informal sharing. Or like we have dinner together a lot of the time or they have a covered patio and they said, hey, while we're out of town, feel free to use the covered patio. Um, so that's the informal sharing. The formal sharing is like, we used to share a washing machine between our three houses. There was another time that, there've been times that we shared internet between our three houses. Taryn and Jared had the signal because they're in the center and the rest of us paid to use it. So. I think the resource I offer is look for look for ways you can do stuff with your neighbors. Look for ways that you and your neighbors can help each other out. And it starts with getting to know your neighbors. I mean, that was the thing. I guess I'm lucky. I grew up in a neighborhood where neighbors knew each other and there weren't any fences on property lines. And my the little boy next door who was six months older than me was automatically my best friend. And his dad and my dad planted the hedgerow together instead of building a fence. And when Peter and I played together, we always just crawled through the hedgerow. We never went around on the sidewalk. Um, and so I think to me, that's just being neighbors. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, looking, and when Lois started Los Angeles Eco Village, what she called the eco village process in a neighborhood where people were really afraid is how she talked about it. She had to be much more intentional because people weren't talking to their neighbors. And so she started just going around and knocking on people's doors and inviting them over for, for lunch. And mm -hmm. then eventually they started having potlucks and that's how we build community. And that's how we build mutual aid. And that's how we build revolution. Ooh, yes. Ah, Awesome, Rachel. That's a great note to end it on. Thank you. Thanks there so are much. some other questions for you uh, in the Q&A box and also in the chat. Um, so I wanna, I wanna give time to our other presenters, but if you are able to find the Q&A box, find the chat, just type in your answers there. That would be okay. much appreciated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for everything you're bringing. 
Beautiful. All right, so now we're gonna travel from Portland, Oregon, Oregon over to Hawaii. And we have Robert and Allie with us from Loia Community. Welcome to you both. Looking forward to your presentation. Aloha, good Aloha. morning. Yeah, super. Um, I guess we'll launch right into it and introduce ourselves. Um, so I started with Intentional Community uh, back in the 80s, uh, I visited Twin Oaks, and since that time, uh, that's when I was at the University of Virginia, and then I visited dozens and dozens and lived in a few intentional communities. Uh, some of the communities that are an influence for me besides Twin Oaks are Zeg uh, in Germany and Tamara in Portugal. Uh, also, I was co-founder of La Kea Community here in Hawaii. Uh, back in 2004. Um, so that's a little bit of my uh, background. Also, my background before being here was doing nonprofit environmental work, permaculture work uh, in Washington, D.C. and other parts on the mainland. So, and Allie, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, my name is Allie, and um, I came from the world of professional sports. So I was a synchronized swimmer on the national team for the United States and Olympic team. And community has really met my need post sports to be uh, part of a team that feels like a family. Uh, and I'm Robert's partner, um, and I'm starting to run the operations here. So that's why I joined Rob on the call. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to just talk for another minute or so. Allie also is doing, uh, did a master's in transformational coaching at UCLA, and we have a big focus on personal growth and development here, as well as ecological sustainability, uh, social justice, and um, values that are probably similar to many communities. Um, but the reason I think that it's interesting to have both of us on is that I founded the neighborhood. I bought a old farm, uh, and I think at this point, I'm going to switch into slides. Um, I think you've seen what we look like. And I'm going to hold on a second here. Oh, right. Yeah, I got to oh, hold on. <laughs> I got to share screen. There we go. All right. I'm going to share. And then I'm going to click on play. OK, is that working, Cynthia? You see looks, our a group photo? Yeah, it looks great. Great. OK, so um, so in terms of um, the community, our community is fairly transient. There are six of us who live here on staff right now. Uh, then we also have some longer term renters. Uh, we also do get woofers and volunteers in. And then we also, because we're in Hawaii, uh, a lot of our, our revenue is coming from short-term renters, uh, what we would call transient or vacation renter uh, folks and, um, and people that might want to come in for a retreat or a workshop. Um, I'm going to move. Hold on a second. How do I? I'm sharing. How do I? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna locate you where we are. If you look on the bottom right, you'll see the town of Pahoa. That's our nearest town. Uh, and then on the big island, we're out towards, we're on the Southeast coast, about 45 minutes south of Hilo Airport. We are in probably the most dense uh, intentional community area in the United States. Although people here will tell you we're in the kingdom of Hawaii, not in the United States. Um, this is what the property looked like when it was a farm um, back in the 80s, and then it became abandoned. It was mostly macadamia trees. Uh, luckily, there, they had planted some other things like mango and avocado, but it was a conventional farm. No one had done anything for 25 years when I bought the property, um, and then I did a subdivision, and I subdivided up. This is the, the view along our um, uh, Red Road, which is along the coast. This is about 300 feet from the ocean. And, um, and then this is our front gate. We are completely gated and fenced, um, not to keep our neighbors out because we do have a pedestrian gate there, which you can see on the right, which is open, uh, but it is to keep the feral pigs out um, because we're very focused on food sustainability. We actually fence the entire 25, uh, 25 acre neighborhood um, this is what the 
um, the lots look like. We're in the upper right, and that is an eight and a half acre lot. And then our nearest neighbor is a, a good friend and also communitarian who has a three acre lot. There are five three acre lots in this part of the subdivision. And then our neighbor, uh, elderly Hawaiian man liked what we're doing. He sold us the 16 acres next door. And now we're um, going to be selling more two acre lots to the left side. Uh, so ultimately the neighborhood will be a gated fenced community of about, um, I guess that's about 41 acres. Uh, and the idea is there are actually communities, little sub pods within the neighborhood, like on the first lot, um, there is a group of about 10 people that live there and they have a bunch of different alternative structures uh, as well as a code approved house. Um, so there's kind of the, the concept here is this entire neighborhood is an eco village and then there are privately held lots within that. Um, this is what it looks like with an aerial drone view looking down on our eight acres. Uh, we are totally off grid. You'll see we have 72 solar panels. Uh, we have a 19,000 gallon water catchment tank. We have about 12,000 square feet under roof uh, and we can accommodate uh, easily uh, two, three dozen people. And if, if people camp, then we can accommodate more than that or if they share rooms. Um, but yeah, that gives you a, a little bit of a, a sense. We do have quite a lot of uh, food production, although because we are in a, a lava area where there's not much topsoil. Uh, we have garden beds around uh, our kitchen uh, dining lodge building, but about 90% of the land is really more focused on trees, coconuts, bananas, papayas, citrus, avocado, uh, breadfruit, this type of thing. Um, these are again, our solar panels. Uh, this is our garden. We do grow a lot of greens. You can also see some uh, Polynesian taro behind Joanna, who's a, um, who lived here. She lives in Poland. Um, mangoes, coconuts. Um, we also uh, have the vegetable garden. This is on our dining uh, lanai. It's an open air area. Our temperatures range from a low of 60 in the winter to a high of 90 in the summer. So we're in a really uh, lovely zone. We don't need heating or cooling, although we do have air conditioning in our co-working spaces. Um, these are our two residential buildings. They are 12 by 12 bedrooms and they can be set up with queen size bunk beds. And uh, most folks are living in one of these rooms. Most folks are not sharing a room. Uh, also at the bottom right of the building that's on the right, uh, you might be able to pick out, we have a geothermal well that has mineral rich warm water for our spa area, the hot tub and the cold plunge and the um, uh, aquatic body work pool. Alley is a uh, uh, aquatic body work uh, as well. And then here's what one of the beds looks like. We are a hospitality business. So we do set beds up for short-term guests to make them feel really welcome and cozy. And uh, this is a co-working space that I mentioned is air conditioned. We have a lot of remote workers and we had a lot of people that discovered us during the pandemic, a lot of young people that work online. Uh, this is our main event space. It's called the Mango Temple. It's a 30 by 60 greenhouse with a wooden floor and we can host yoga, dance, meditation, sound baths, uh, as well as pickleball. And here's our kitchen. We have a um, uh, 500 square foot kitchen and we can produce a huge amount of food. Um, these are some of the folks that have worked here in our kitchen before for different events. Uh, here's our hot tub. That's what it looks like from the bottom of the hot tub. At night, we have more stars visible here than anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's really a dark sky here and uh, it's amazing if you, if you want to. There's. Uh, alley and people doing aquatic body work, dolphin dance, watsu, this type of thing. Um, and then there's another group of folks here. Uh, again, we have had quite a few transients, um, but we also do have people that come back again and again. Um, and we do really focus on diversity and we also have a lot of international people. Right now, I think we have like at least six or seven people from other countries. So. 
I think that's um, enough of a presentation. And then I'm gonna, inch, again, Ali is, um, uh, started the Hawaii Eco Retreat. And the concept is that she will then be administering the, um, the operations of this property while I focus on the neighborhood as a whole. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Ali to talk about Hawaii Eco Retreat. Thanks, Rob. So uh, before the pandemic, you know, Lolia was running a lot of events uh, as a retreat center. Um, and of course, during COVID that really slowed or shut down and we switched into more long-term rental. And now we are more of an intro to community. So a lot of people come here to stay anywhere from a few days to a few months to, you know, they're kind of maybe experimenting with what living in community feels like. They're trying it out. They might be their first time. Um, but it's an intro because there's not really too much commitment or investment. There's not too much um, time commitment or too much financial commitment other than, you know, monthly uh, rent. Um, and I noticed that, you know, we, we built up our staff to people who really want to live here and call this home. And I noticed that I was experiencing a desire to feel more connected. So, um, you know, our retreat center, we've really said we were focused on a personal growth and development experience. And I'm noticing in my life that I really um, feel ready to focus on a group growth experience. Uh, and I think that's what community has to offer. However, I think it's a long way from really focusing on oneself and being centered in your own life to kind of what being community minded means. And not everyone is ready to jump in and invest and has the capital to buy in to be a member owner. And it just seemed, I just noticed there seems to be like a really big chasm between those two ends of the spectrum. And so I was wondering what could, might be in between. So what I've done is, um, you know, I've designed a three month in-house retreat that's gonna start here in July. And it's, it's kind of, instead of having a one week long retreat where you go somewhere and someone else just teaches you a bunch of stuff and then you kind of leave and forget all about it and go back to your own life. It's more of a lifestyle oriented retreat where we're inviting people to come live their lives here alongside others and really feel what, it, what it's like to create a group container and drop in with a group of people um, for a longer time, especially in a world where it feels like everything really is changing. So um, that's an exciting program we have coming up soon. And um, you know, we've been talking about it with the people who are here indefinitely. We have 11 people who are here indefinitely uh, to, to see you know, which of those people might be interested in this, et cetera. And what's different about it is that I'm looking for more time commitment from people. I'm looking for a three month commitment instead of just a one month commitment. Uh, and I find that you know, just in general, following my own excitement and joy and fulfillment um, is uh, to drop in more deeply uh, and, and, and in a way that meets our financial needs and our overhead costs. Um, so that's what Hawaii Eco Retreat is up to now. Um, what we're looking for, there are different ways to be part of our community. You can be a volunteer, a work trader, um, staff, uh, a renter. Um, you could buy a lot or become a co-owner. So those are some great ways to get involved. Um, Hawaii Eco Retreat is our new website. It doesn't pop up on Google yet, but it is just hawaiieco-retreat.com is our new website that we're in the process of putting up for the business that's running the operations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's a good place to, to leave it. So with that, I'm complete. Thanks so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Robert and Allie. Um, it's been, uh, yeah, nice to see the project develop, having followed it for a few years. It just seems like you continue to grow and are up to, to great work. And I really, Ali, I really resonated with what you said about people wanting to find an intro to community community. Um, so part of my work is I'm a community matchmaker. So I support people who want to join community. And a lot of them, you know, it is, it's a big lifestyle shift and they kind of want to try it out before committing. So it's great to know that your community offers that kind of opportunity. And uh, I think there's a lot of interest, maybe even on this call, people are asking uh, how they can find out more um, and, and the cost for some of these retreat mm -hmm. programs. Yeah, absolutely. So I can be reached at hawaiieco-retreat at gmail.com. Um, and that's the best way to get hold of me. Can you type that in the chat, sweetheart? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
and um, people will see the the pricing on your on your website. Um, the pricing's not listed there. I haven't gotten that far to have everything listed on the website, but I, if they email, if they reach out via that contact form, um, I will send them an email. Like, and if they tell me whether they're more interested in being a volunteer, more interested in being a renter, or more interested, like which parts they're interested in, then I will send them the more detailed information about um, that you know particular offering. Great. And your email was Rachel. At, you'll put it in the chat, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, the website is hawaiieco-retreat.com and then the best website is hawaiieco-retreat at gmail.com. Yeah, okay, okay. good. Great yeah. ways to learn more about this program. Good, okay. Super. Uh, let's see, we had another question uh, for you, Robert. Can you speak to the form of governance at your community? Sure. Um, well, so I should say in the beginning, my concept was I wanted to um, have co-owners. Um, and unfortunately, what I found out was that it was actually more difficult, sort of like Rachel, to find co-owners um, than I thought it was going to be. And so then in terms of building out the vision and because we wanted to do things with code approved uh, buildings, I ended up borrowing a bunch of money. And so my situation now is I'm either looking for a co-owner or like I would love to have a group of say 20 people all own this place together. That has proven difficult to find a way to transition. So right now I am the owner of this property um, and I am hoping at some point to be able to transition it either into some sort of uh, whether it's an LLC, whether it's a land trust, whether it's some sort of entity where there is co-ownership of the whole. Um, but for right now, I am the decision maker as the owner. However, I would say that um, our staff is quite empowered and we only have people who really can take ownership over a particular area. And most lifestyle cultural issues that are not uh, a big financial issue, uh, there is much more a sense, I, I would say, of loose uh, consensus or at least majority uh, opinion. Um, so, you know, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of being the ultimate decision maker on all matters. And frankly, people would walk with their feet uh, away from here if, um, if they didn't like uh, what we were doing. So, yeah, I think that's probably enough for now in governance. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I think you responded, somebody had asked about the intergenerational piece. You said you have elders there. Um, how about children, kids? We, ha we have a couple kids right now and we are wanting to be more child friendly. Um, it's definitely something Allie and I have been talking about a lot. And the other aspect of having a neighborhood is we're thinking about having one of the two acre lots be set aside for uh, babies, infants, toddlers, uh, like preschool uh, age kids, zero to six. Um, and in that way, we could support families having affordable housing, shared child care. Um, so particularly if people have little ones or they're wanting to have a little one, uh, I'm definitely interested to talk to you because I would like for one of the two acre lots in the neighborhood um, to be set up as a child centric environment. Of course, being a hospitality business, um, it has been somewhat difficult to integrate um, kids, but we have had really successful experiences, not all successful, but we definitely have had success. Um, and right now we have a really lovely one and a half year old boy with us. Um, and it's just awesome to have kids here and you have a bunch of adults. So hopefully we will have a lot more kids in the neighborhood soon. Mm, great, great. Oh, beautiful. I just love seeing the photos of just this lush tropical, all the gardens, and that big events hall. It just seems like you're creating a beautiful space there. So thank you both so much for your work. And um, feel free folks, if you have more questions for Rachel and Allie to uh, just put those in the chat and they can respond to you there. Great, okay, thank you both. And now we will go uh, all the way from Hawaii across the United States to Manhattan, which is 
much closer to where I am in Vermont. And we have Todd with us from Pennington's Friends House, another urban community right in Manhattan. Welcome, Todd. Looking forward to your presentation. Hey, thank you, Cynthia. It's a real honor to be talking to you today. Um, quick introduction, but then I want to get to a moment of silence because we are a Quaker institution and we, we love those moments of silence for recentering. Um, I am in charge of outreach here at Pennington, so I'm talking to you today, but I am a co-manager co of the uh, project here, the Pennington uh, Friends House with my wife, Robin. You might hear her in the background. Um, and we also have a facilities uh, manager, uh, James, which is very much an equal partner in the work that we do here. Um, but let me get started by sharing my screen. Oops, start my slideshow. Can you all see the slideshow? Yes. You do, okay. So let's just enjoy uh, just a minute of silence um, in the tradition of Quakers and other communities uh, that enjoy meditation. And you're gonna see some scenes from our neighborhood that I hope uh, are very relaxing and enjoyable. Okay, I hope that was pleasant. Let me see if I can get back now. Yes, thank you. Really enjoyed the, the snowball. Mm. Whoops, let me go to my next slide. Hold on. So um, yeah, the Pennington Friends House, uh, we were created in 1897 and we've been building communities since then. Um, th these are some of our wonderful residents. Um, and they're doing um, one of their jobs. We, we're uh, a collaborative house where residents pitch in with chores and also do collaborative decision-making. So they're out cleaning the uh, sidewalk in front of our building, which is a requirement in the city uh, during a snowstorm. And it turned in course into a snowball fight. Um, the Quaker community, uh, if you don't know much about Quakers, um, one of our main focuses is, 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 an, is always looking, being interested in, in experimenting with what love can do. Uh, so we don't fight in, in wars. We're interested in rather in the hard work uh, of building uh, the world through love. And we've been in this area since the 1860s. Uh, um, this was originally Peter Stuyvesant's farm. Peter Stuyvesant was the Dutch governor of, of uh, New York. Uh, before it became New York when it was New Amsterdam. And he retired up to this area. Um, and the Quakers bought this property from one of his grandchildren, kind of ironic because Peter Stuyvesant did not like Quakers. He um, uh, wanted to not give religious freedom in the early uh, colony. And a Quaker went back to Holland and sued for religious freedom based on the fact that uh, the Dutch had it in their original country. So they had to give it to their colonists. And that kind of set in motion this idea of religious freedom in the United States. Uh, it gave Quakers and the Jewish community a, a foothold here in New York. Um, we were a brownstone. Um, we're, we're not a handicapped accessible, unfortunately. Um, we have four floors of bedrooms, 26. 
Um, we are intergenerational. We have members uh, here or, or participants in this experiment from the age of 20 to 85. Um, about 20% are Quaker, uh, about 24% are people of color. And um, you don't have to be either to live here, but um, we're trying to make it as diverse and uh, as wonderful a community as we can, as close to the beloved community as we all have in mind. Um, we live by simple principles, uh, the, the Quaker principles uh, called the spices, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. And those guide our decision-making and we try to keep, uh, try to keep them in the forefront um, and, uh, as we move through our lives. This is a mural we painted during the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, the marchers went up and down our street. We gave them water. We participated in the marches and we put this, this mural up, but we felt like that was just a nice book cover and that we needed to do more. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, I got to move some faces out of the way here. Um, yeah, so we have 26 long-term resident rooms, two guest rooms, um, like uh, our friends in, in, in Hawaii, uh, we make part of our income off of the tourist industry. Um, and those guest rooms can be uh, occupied for up to two weeks. Uh, then we also have sublets. So if you wanted to stay with us and, and kind of test us out, you can rent a room from a resident who's traveling or going home and uh, you can stay up to three months. And we have chef prepared uh, dinners Sunday through Thursday. We have been cooking in that kitchen since the 1890s. Um, at one point, this was one of the few kitchens that was interracial in the city. Um, and um, we, we predate the Department of Buildings. They didn't even know we existed as a kitchen uh, because we started before they did. Um, next slide. Woof. Um, so there's also breakfast available. If you live with us, you have your internet cable, utilities included. Uh, all residents, like I said, have chores um, and they participate in communal decision-making. We use what we call Quaker process, which is really just restorative justice process, uh, more commonly known today, where um, we, don't, we don't try to debate and then vote. We try to put all of our ideas into a kind of a central space and then come up with the very best idea. When the pandemic struck, I was fearful that our communal way of living would mean the end of us uh, because New York, of course, was the epicenter of the COVID pandemic. It actually, because we had already been primed to care about each other and think about each other, we were well suited to survive. We instituted science-based protocols. Uh, we opened up the house, used the house's natural design to, to uh, keep the air moving. When people got sick, we supported them in their rooms. We kept them fed. One of our residents, the 84-year-old one, stayed in her room for an entire year waiting on a vaccine. And we sang happy birthday from the street up to her window because uh, we couldn't celebrate with her. Um, communal spaces include a, our Victorian parlor you see here rooftop deck, backyard, and project spaces, which I've just added next door. Um, just wanna show you a few pictures of the neighborhood. We're near Stuyvesant Park. Um, we're also close to a Quaker meeting house and a Quaker school. So we have children in our backyard. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, they, they must all be inside right now because you can't hear them. Uh, we do a lot of group activities, a lot of community activities, uh, concerts on our roof, like you see here that was uh, transmitted uh, worldwide. Um, cookouts, we go to museums together, uh, we participate in races and uh, protests together. Um, we dress up for Halloween. I mean, the, the community is vibrant and strong and grew stronger during the pandemic. Uh, which was, again, something that we were, we were surprised about. Uh, we do try to eat uh, as healthy as possible. It's probably the best meal in the city for $10. Um, we have a CSA and one of our residents is a chef, cooks for us, and then we bring in another chef uh, from outside uh, for variety and also to cover each other. Um, but we, we eat well every night. Uh, here's an image of some of our wonderful residents planting flowers out front. Um, and I know I've showed a lot of food, but really eating together is, is kind of the soul of the house. Um, 
the, this apple pie was made for James, our resident who uh, was very ill and came back and we welcomed back with a, a pie. Um, we all like to say that three things got us through the pandemic, a loving community, lots of fresh air and lots of desserts. Um, so after we started this, this, this mural project, we decided we wanted to do something more impactful around Black Lives Matter issues and, and, and the obvious um, predominantly white community that we were. So we, we created something called the Bayard Rustin Residency. I don't know if you know of Bayard Rustin, but he was a Quaker uh, activist that um, worked with Martin Luther King very closely. He's the one that introduced nonviolent uh, protest methods. Uh, he also organized the March on Washington, but because he was gay, uh, he was kept out of the history. And um, he attended the meeting next door and we worked very closely with his surviving partner to set up this residency. It gives a year to a BIPOC person working to end systemic racism. They could be an artist, an activist, a community organizer, but a BIPOC committee selects them. And then that person is recommended to the house. Our house operates uh, in this way that, that any new person coming here to live long term is vetted or interviewed by a committee of the residents. And so the final decision uh, is made you know, by the house. But last year they uh, agreed with the committee and, and thought Desmond Beach, this artist from Baltimore would be a wonderful addition. And he has been, he's transformed the house. We're transforming him. He's making fantastic artwork that deals with the trauma of, of uh, living in a black skin in this country. Um, and it looks like we probably will have a writer for next year, uh, a, a young trans woman uh, or one, sorry, young gay woman from Alabama. Um, I wanna give you a quick walkthrough of the house if, if I've got a few more minutes and then just talk about how you might wanna uh, apply if you wanna live here. And this might help some of you all to planning your communities. Thought I had music with this, but I don't see it or hear it. This is a time lapse of the mural we made. Feel free to ask any questions at this point if you have any. So the rooms are real simple. They're kind of like uh, dorm rooms, might have been. Years ago, used to have two people per room. Now we only have one. Shared private bathrooms in the hall. This is our amazing view from our rooftop. This is our grand parlor. Was the house was designed by the architect to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We have a beautiful, wonderful piano. This is our dining room and backyard. All right. Such a beautiful space. Thank you. Let me see if I can progress to the next slide. Ah. So if you're interested in living with us, and, and if not, even just this is how we operate, um, this might be helpful to some of some of our friends around the country. Um, uh, we do require a thoughtful uh, essay uh, questionnaire application. Um, we're really trying to get a feel for a person's um, priorities, what they want to get out of community, what they can bring to community, and how they how they interpret the spices, right? The simplicity, peace, integrity, and so forth uh, principles into their own lives. Uh, we're not looking for perfect people. We're not looking for, it's not a fraternity sorority. Um, we interview one person at a time. Uh, so it's not competitive to live here. Um, but people that do succeed here, that, that, that uh, do end up being invited to live here, uh, meet our priorities of diversity, Quaker or Quaker-like uh, uh, values, thoughtful essays, flexibility, an interest of, in serving others, responsibility, and social conflict resolution skills. Um, you know, communal living is not for everybody. Uh, it may be at some point in their life, but it, it does take some skills to, 
live in a house with 26 people and 26 opinions. And um, so we try to try to make sure people are ready and know what they're getting into. And for us, you have to be patient. Uh, it could take six months to a year to find an opening that works for you. Um, and we keep applications, you know, active. Um, and if you're selected, then um, the, the, the house interviews you, they invite you to dinner. If you're local, um, if not, you get a video tour of the house and the room and get a chance to see what it's like. Um, and then if you join us, uh, like most places, we ask for first and last month rent and a security deposit. But let's talk money. Uh, in New York, a room in this neighborhood, a one bedroom apartment costs $4,000 a month. Uh, our, our cost to live here is 1000 to up to our biggest room, which is $1,700. Um, and that includes all of your utilities and all your food. Um, so it's a pretty good, pretty good deal. And we're able to do that because we're a nonprofit. We have a nonprofit board and a very small staff uh, committed uh, to doing all the unfun stuff that nobody really wants to do when they run a big house. Um, and, oh, the other thing is it's month to month. So if you move in and after three months you decide this isn't right, or I got another opportunity, I need to move to Seattle, you can leave with a month's notice. Um, so it's not a, you're not locked into that year, year to year thing. Um, Isaac Pennington uh, is the man we're named after. He was a Quaker from the 1600s. And he said, our life is love and peace and tenderness and bearing one with another and helping one another. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You so much, Todd. Oh, amazing, amazing. It's just, it's boggling my mind that your community has been in that home since the 1800s. That's so special. I think that's um, certainly the oldest intentional community we have had on this um, program so far. And, um, and I really also appreciate what you shared about the pandemic and how that actually made your community stronger. And I just think about how, um, how things may have been different if especially the elders had community support like you all had um, in your house. Um, yeah. yeah, I like how you refer to 60 and over as elder. I'm 60, I personally identify as youthful, but um, that's a very polite term for, for us 60 and over. Uh, and my wife and I did have a very different experience. We probably would have bugged out in New York like everybody else. Uh, I mean, this place shut down and we sat here together um, and we even made up funny stories to keep our minds occupied. Like we, we joked about digging a hole to rob a bank down the street, you know, dig a tunnel and, uh, we assigned roles and we drew maps and, you know, it really was a time when, when there wasn't much going on except what you could generate yourself. And, and we found that, that focusing on arts, focusing on caring for each other was the thing. And, and here's the thing that other people have made. I think we have always lived in these, these types of communities. And the reason we're still here as a species is because this works best, living like this, where we've got resources with each other. Uh, children are welcome. Um, we don't have any right now. We wish we did. We want to be grandparents uh, personally, but um, children are welcome to, to live here with a parent. What happens is the bigger rooms that are better for couples get grabbed by residents that have been here the longest. We, we give, we open, we open the room to, to move into first to the house. So if someone leaves, there's a big room available. Then a house resident can, can say, I would like to move into that room. Um, and so the bigger rooms have all kind of filled up with people. We've, we've had people here 25 years. Um, so it's, uh, it's a long-term experiment. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to add too that our, our founding board were abolitionists. And uh, when I went to the new board to get them to fund the Bayard Rustin residency, I pointed that out, that, we, that our original board were very dedicated to uh, equality and ending slavery. And uh, so the Bayard Rustin project has been funded for three years and um, I'm hoping to make it uh, the thing that I leave behind long-term. Mm. Um, and let's see, any other questions? Yeah, you've been touching on the questions having to do with openings. Um, do you have any openings now or how frequently do you get them? 
So we get about six to 10 openings a year. Uh, like other people have said around uh, the country, people tend to early in life, you know, stay mobile because they go off to school or get a new job. Um, and so that tends to be the population that comes and goes. The, the older population, if they like it here, tend to stay. Um, and we've, like I said, had people here 24, 25 years. Um, so yeah, it is, I, I would say you've got to be kind of patient, put in your application um, and know that it may take six months for a room to open. Um, we, we really do value um, communal thinking and that kind of is counter to the corporate you know, I'm going to watch out for myself and press for myself. So if you really want to get here get and live here, you know, come with that kind of that patience and that openness, because uh, when somebody's too pushy, that's a red flag to us that they're going to be maybe difficult to live with. Uh, New York is filled with pushy people. You can find them just go out the door. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to be one of the zeitgeists to this community to be really aggressive. Gotcha. Yeah. How about guests uh, do you welcome yes we have two guest rooms they can they can uh, stay um up to two weeks and they're invited to work with them eat with us and we're still booking even though we've gotten into the high range of of covid uh for the city we're still open um we've elected as a house not to wear masks uh, because our biggest exposure is when we eat and we tend to well we, because of the summer, we've got three different great spaces to eat, so we all spread out. Um, and we've, we've really been able to control the spread of COVID. When people get sick here, they tend to pick it up at work and, and come home with it. Um, and then as we all regularly test, as soon as that's isolated, then that person will quarantine and we support them. Um, I've had to spend a week you know, in one of these rooms. It's not fun, but uh, at least all your meals are provided for and, and you know you got people there yeah. to help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else I can help you with? Um, well, I guess just maybe the last question um, sounds like you are open to couples and families and yeah. And that, yeah, that's, that you're yeah. it's just a matter of whether or not the room's right for you. Um, and um, uh, our only, you know, limitation is we are a four story, five story walk up. So you've got, and to be quite honest, this city makes you walk, even though there are services, it, it's biased towards walking. So um, I would just say, if you think about living here, take that in consideration. Um, and down the road, maybe we'll come up with a better solution. But, um, you know, the house is old, it's historic. And so we have narrow doorways that don't work with wheelchairs and so forth. So we've got some other problems. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank well, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Really appreciate your sharing and all that you are up to with your community. And we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. So now I would like to open it up. If anyone in the audience has just more general questions that you would like to pose to all of our presenters, feel free to put that in the Q&A box. Um, and while you're thinking on those questions, I did notice that many of you are uh, looking for community. Many of you said that you don't live in community right now. You're looking to learn more about what's out there uh, and potentially join one of these places. So my question for you three, four panelists uh, is, what advice might you give to someone as they are starting this journey of living in intentional community and might be soon doing a tour to visit places, might be kind of deciding what's their next move gonna be. Yeah, what, what words of wisdom could you give them about how to join community, how to select a community that could be a good fit? And we'll do popcorn style. So whoever wants to go first. Okay, I'll say something because I've, I've been visiting communities for a very long time. Uh, back then, there was, of course, no internet. These days, it's super easy to uh, get information about a lot of communities. Really good to have a video chat. We do interview people 
um, and they interview us. They want to see, um, you know, get a, get a feeling. Um, and I think way better to spend a little bit more time talking to people before um, that way you really get a sense of who they are as people and how you feel energetically in their presence because something can look good with pictures or the, the words, um, you know, may sound really great, but then you just really don't, um, you know, feel resonant with people. And ultimately that is um, the most important thing um, is do you feel resonant with the people? So, you know, take time, get to know them, ask them to have a second chat or a third. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I think visiting communities that are near you, I mean, no matter where you are, I mean, unless you're in an extremely isolated rural area yourself, there are, there's a community or a bunch of communities near you. And it, so especially if you don't have experience living in community, and um, you think you know what you want, uh, I think visiting existing communities will help you to clarify what you want, especially if you're in an urban area, there's probably lots of co-living households. Some of them may be collectively owned. Some of them may be entirely renters. Some of them may be like mine where there's a resident owner. Um, and just, you know, see if you can come over for a tour or for dinner or ask them if they're having a work party, but just to get a feel of what community living is really about. I think that will help you to clarify distinguish between what you think you want, what you really want, and really get deep in your mind and your heart, the fact that no place is perfect. Jeff Kozeny used to do this awesome, um, I miss Jeff, uh, where he would start out by singing Junk Food Junkie before he talked about the fact that people have really high ideals of what communities should be like. But so yeah, I think that's my most important advice is vis visit the communities that you can visit without traveling. Because like, I, I agree that like the opportunities that we have now to video chat or talk on the phone is great, but like actually being there and feeling it out, I think should be really helpful. And then I know that in the written suggestion or questions, there's also for people who want to found a community. I guess I would start with the same advice because a lot of people think they want to found a community because they haven't encountered the community that meets their perfect ideal. But guess what? As a community founder, I will say that the communities I've been involved in founding don't meet my perfect ideal either. <laughs> so <laughs> check. I would just say again, uh, like I said earlier, make sure that you understand the, the decision making power dynamic of any community. Um, I think the hardest thing about living in community is that you have to give up that kind of capitalist, I get to decide everything uh, attitude, right? Um, our residents laugh. Um, one of the questions they asked during the interview is, how would you feel if you put something down on a table, you know, in the parlor and you came back and it had been moved? Because you, there, you know, everything is open to change in a community, a common community. And you have to, you have to really know what you're giving up as far as control and, and what you're getting from that, you know, by giving that up and, and, and know yourself. If you're the type of person that, that really likes to be in control, a community is going to be a challenge for you, right? You're going to have to be self-aware about that. Um, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a privileged white male that's used to, you know, being rewarded for making tough decisions. And this has been a really learning experience about sitting back and, and letting the group come to that choice and decision uh, and not, you know, me go, oh, I got the answer. Um, so it, it's, I think the psychology of living in community is more important than anything. I think if you understand what you're getting into and know who you are, you can you can find a great match. Yeah, that's beautiful, Todd. I, the, one of my second questions was going to be, um, like, who is a good fit or how might someone need to adapt to better thrive in community? And I think you really spoke to that. And if, and if you, Rachel or Todd or Allie, if you want to add anything to that piece, we'd welcome to hear it. I think that one way that you have to adapt is you have to really learn your own boundaries better and learn how to communicate that, them more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, really, even at the most basic level of 
whether or not you really want to chat at 7 15 a.m in the kitchen in the morning um you know learning how to say no um because we're used to being really polite and if someone says you know the other day someone greeted me and said how did you sleep and i said thanks so much for asking i'm being quiet until after i finish my yoga practice but that's taken a lot of growth to get to that point to be able to do that you know first there was just answer the question it's not that hard be polite and then there was be angry and be annoyed that someone's even talking to me and then there was a stage of acceptance of just quietly communicating and i'm not always good at it it's an ongoing <clears throat> practice but you know you're gonna bump into each other bump into people more often energetically and you really need to like you know, learn where your own edges are um, and practice communicating those as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And that was a great story to illustrate. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, well, I see Justin has put in the Q&A box um, two questions. Um, so I think we'll just leave it on on this. Um, Justin is asking if any of your communities have created emergency plans for disasters and also if you have any particular ways that you deal with health care in your communities. If, if Yeah, so I'd like to hear if you do have a, a plan and if there is um, something more unique about how your members handle health care. I can start again. Um, <clears throat> I'll say about natural disasters. Um, we live in an active lava zone. So that is something for people to know. We did have a lava flow four years ago that was three miles away. Um, and we also have hurricanes here. Uh, we are quite isolated. Um, and yeah, during the hurricane, I had to clear our roadway with a backhoe and chainsaws. Um, you know, we, we are very isolated. Um, one of the ways that we communicate with each other is we have a Facebook messenger, um, thread that's always ongoing. Um, people do have medical emergencies and the nearest hospital is at least 45 to 60 minutes away. Um, so that's important for people to know if they have medical conditions. Um, you know, we want to find out if people are allergic to bees or they have any other health issues. Um, this is quite important uh, to find out before people show up on site if they have allergies or medical conditions. Um, and then in terms of, yeah, disasters, uh, we have dealt with that type of thing in the past. Um, and it is important to have a plan. We do have a building that is um, basically rated for Category 5 hurricane. Uh, thankfully, we've never had anything like that. Um, but we had a category one hurricane um, eight years ago. So we are prepared um, as much as we can um, to serve as, a, as a, a safe place in the neighborhood for people because a lot of people don't have buildings that are that uh, stable or secure in our area. Um, so we're urban. So the kinds of disasters that we need to be prepared for are basically the collapse of capitalism. And I believe that living in community is the best way to prepare for the collapse of capitalism. We grow tons of food here, far more than our little household can eat. Um, the food that we don't grow, you know, we don't have enough land to grow all our beans and grains. Or if we, if we did want to grow all our beans and grains, we'd have to chop down our 13 silly fruit trees to make more space for that. But we like the fruit and the, and yeah. So I think, um, we do have, I mean, we have quite a bit of water stored and we could have more water stored. Um, and there is a neighborhood emergency preparedness team, which we're connected with. Sometimes residents have actively participated in it, talked about earthquake preparedness. Um, I mean, the fires, are, again, since we're urban, we're not directly threatened by fire. It's more about air quality and really the only thing we can do to prepare for that is, you know, talk about when we're gonna close the windows versus open them. Um, as far as health, we, we support each other in our healing choices, you know, growing our food, making good food, growing herbs, um, supporting each other so we don't all have to spend 40 hours a week working for the man. Um, almost everyone in the households on the south side of the street 
qualifies for the Oregon Health Plan, which is um, Medicaid. So, I mean, we, we're not, we don't have a shared fund for healthcare. We all have independent finances, but I, I think that really supporting each other's health is part of our preparedness for the, and, and people think of the demise of capitalism and the demise of the petroleum economy as something that's going to happen suddenly, whereas I think it's been happening my entire life. And it's just at some point, someone starts to notice how it's affecting them. And the more of a safety net I have, the longer it might take to experience the direct effects on me. And it starts with, you know, minor inconveniences. I went to the hardware store to get this thing and they didn't have it. So um, yeah, living in community. Check. I, I just want to say friends all speak my mind. Um, and I'll just add that be sure that when you're thinking about healthcare that you have an end game uh, boundary set. You know, um, we're struggling right now with our 84 year old, 85 year old about when will be the appropriate time for her to not live here. And that's a hard discussion to have because if you're happy, this is your world, this is your life, but, but medically, physically, you, everyone's gonna come up with limitations. And I think, I think if you're successful, you're gonna have to think about like, what are our boundaries about, about what we can and can't do? Uh, when this person had their cataracts done a year ago, the whole house came together and gave her a battery of like 10 drops a day, 10 different sessions of drops a day for like a month. And we had a flow chart and we, we all pitched in and did that. And I think community is good at that kind of care. Um, and as far as disasters, when we had a giant water crisis here in the house, um, everybody was on board. We had, instead of a bucket brigade, we had a towel brigade and the water that came out from a sprinkler was mopped up within 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and, and that would have never have happened in an apartment complex. That would have just ruined room after floor after floor. And um, I think community creates that kind of unity uh, for crisis. And so I think we're, we are, we are going to be the ones that survive whatever crisis uh, comes. We always have. Community unity. Yeah. Great. Oh, thank you all so much. This has been really inspiring and I'm appreciating you taking the time to be here with us. And I, I know that it's spring and lots is happening, especially Rachel, you shared that a lot going on with your garden. So yeah, just, just appreciating you being here and sharing with us. Thank you also to our audience for asking all of those wonderful questions. If you know of another community that you're really curious about, or if you yourself live in a community, um, we are looking for more presenters. So I'm gonna put the uh, form uh, there in the chat so you can invite other communities to go ahead and sign up to give a presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, FIC is a nonprofit organization. So we do all of our events on sliding scale or free of charge. So I'm gonna put the link also in the chat um, for our donate page. If you feel like you would like to make a contribution, we would so appreciate it. And yeah, just wonderful presentations all around. I can see all the appreciation pouring into the chat. Um, so thank you so much again and uh, have a great, great rest of your day all. Bye, take care.